Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Lint. I'm the Chief Scientist and VP of Research at ArcSan. Uh, I am uh, representing Security Guy on the panel today. And to keep it a fair fight, we brought three not security guys uh, to talk about uh, how data is uh, playing a part in uh, user experience and security and how to maintain that balance. Because uh, all the time, you know, uh, at least the, the common trope is to uh, say that those are diametrically opposed and that uh, you know, there's absolutely no way that security and user experience can work together. Uh, so hopefully we're going to uh, work to dispel that myth today. And uh, I will uh, give uh, the opportunity uh, to the panelists here to uh, introduce themselves. So, Giannis, let's start with you. Giannis here. Uh, representing the challenge of part, again, I repeat myself. Uh, leading growth and, um, from a customer uh, acquisition point of view and revenue uh, for Moniz. Yeah, my name is uh, Ramte Matin. Uh, I'm one of the few Norwegian banks here. Uh, I'm the lead technological strategist, uh, working with mainly ensuring that we have the right uh, technological stack to, to realize our strategy and also from uh, working from a business development perspective. I'm Mayat Gilani from Rabobank. I, I work with uh, um, both small, medium, and uh, large business, including corporate, and I work on the corporate business platform. I also work partly on the retail side on innovation. So it's basically cover all the different customers. Excellent. Well, uh, as, as was said, and I will repeat, uh, if there are any questions or clarifications, uh, feel free to, you know, as, as uh, it permits, interrupt and, and ask a question. We will uh, attempt to leave some time at the end uh, to take questions from the crowd, but uh, let's make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so let's set the stage. Um, you know, the user experience goals of the organizations and institutions as well as the security goals of the institutions uh, on the surface can sometimes seem like they're in conflict. Um, so in terms of goals, I'd kind of like to set the stage uh, with some of the examples of what your institution uh, holds as a principle or a goal uh, for both security and user experience. Um, Actually, uh, let's start uh, down here at the end uh, with my, uh, so can you describe to me some of the goals that have been set out by your leadership team for well, you know, security in US? Sure, I mean, if you first look at uh, Rabobank, we are, first of all, a safe bank. People trust us, so we can't break that trust by having you know, a security, a bad security, so everything is built around that trust. But at the same time, we understand the customer needs, and I don't think there should be conflict between the two, which a lot of people think there is a clash happening, but we have actually embraced it and are using it for various different uh, use cases. So I can give you some of the Please. examples. So uh, both security fraud auth authorization, all of these uh, sort of uh, experiences for the customer we, we've uh, used. So uh, we started looking at, for example, payments. Uh, we integrated a, a way to check to, when you're sending money to someone to check the IBAN to see who they are. Mm -hmm. And then we created a package and created a FinTech out of it and pushed it outside Rabobank. So, so not only just uh, for our use, but for the old Netherlands and now globally so that anybody can take that uh, service and use it. So that was an integration in making it safe to make a payment. Mm -hmm. uh, we also use uh, authorization, not uh, just for a form to make sure you know, there's no security leaks, but also by customizing. So if you have, uh, depending on what type of authorization you have in the business banking, we can create your own experience out of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, with I'm sure you know with large corporate and large businesses, uh, to make a payment, for example, it could be 10 different roles, 10 different people doing it. So we, we customize the, each of their experiences using these technologies and actually uh, we turn that negative aspect into a positive. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Ronson? Yes. 
What was the question? Uh, the <laughs> That's a very long <laughs> this is good. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, uh, let's set the stage with uh, sort of an overarching uh, right, view of right, right, goals right. of both CX, UX, and, uh, and security in your organization. So, so I believe that, that, that trust is one of the most important currencies we as a bank have. Uh, the trust between our customers and, and us uh, is something that we should not compromise in any case. Uh, but there's a, f there's a balance between how you approach uh, new innovation uh, when you want to launch new products and services as, as the one that uh, Merda um, spoke about, um, that, that we usually try to bring our security team on board as, 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 as soon as possible to make sure that, that, that we don't have any, uh, any details that might block the, the, the overall momentum of, of what we're doing. Uh, a lot of the banks uh, present and the fintechs obviously know how, how frequent new products and services are being launched, and we don't want to we, we don't want to compromise that momentum either. But we want to do it in a way where the customer actually feels that the trust between the bank and the new product and service is taken care of and not compromising that. Because going back to to what I said earlier, that 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 trust is a is the most important currency that that we have here. Great, Giannis. Uh, more or less similar with us, uh, despite the fact we are only four years old, um, we, we are proud for being product-led. Uh, what does it mean for us? Um, we, we move fast. You see lots of uh, user testing, uh, qualitative, quantitative, uh, uh, design sprints, releases every week or two. Uh, that's how it has been for the first three years. Then we got a role called uh, Team Performance Security Officer coming in. And then uh, we learned acronyms like um, DPIA. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to embed uh, uh, risk assessments on every product we, uh, we develop, uh, which actually uh, some people took it negatively at the beginning because it was uh, supposed to slow us down. But in reality, we started building much better products. Uh, we're thinking deeper uh, since that uh, was introduced. And we can get it wrong as well, because uh, especially for us, we are still building trust as a new player, so it's going to be very important for a long time. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, data is at the forefront in terms of collection. Uh, the, you know, the, I, there was some sort of regulation that happened in Europe a few years ago that really sort of changed the way that we thought about how we collect data about our users. Um, so I'd kind of like to take this transition to talk about the types of data. Uh, at a high level, um, what sorts of data uh, do you proactively collect um, from your applications and from your web interfaces? Um, and then talk to me about the process of filtering that into your decision-making process as it comes to security. And uh, Ramta, let's start with you on this one. Well, um, I, I wish we did more of that uh, than we already do. Um, it's no secret that, that the banking industry has a lot of data, but, but we are not able to utilize it the way we actually want to do. Uh, I believe you were, you were thinking about the GDPR legislation, <laughs> uh, um, which actually you can, you can choose to see it as a threat or you can choose to see it as an opportunity as well. Mm. Because uh, I think it's good that there's some, uh, some, uh, some good rules about how you want to use the data and you need to get the consent. Uh, but it also opens up some, some ideas and some innovations in terms of how can you actually leverage the data to produce new products and services. Um, because what, what it actually does is, is that it white labels the way that we use the, the customer's data, um, obviously in conjunction with their approval. Uh, and we, um, and, and I believe it's, it definitely is an opportunity to, to, to launch some new products and services, mm. definitely. Giannis, what sort of uh, data does your organization collect? Uh, everything, more or less, <laughs> <laughs> like everybody, but uh, by letting the users know. Uh, yeah, uh, for us, by being a mobile only, not mobile first, but mobile only provider, uh, we gather everything around the device and the transactional behavior. Uh, so uh, why we do it? For authorization purposes, for uh, transaction healthiness. Uh, so uh, we do it to protect users rather than harass them mm. because we collect too much data. That's interesting. Um, and I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on that. Uh, when you talk about collecting things about the device, and things about the, uh, the the place where the user's actually using that. 
Is it, you know, the primary purpose of that for the security of your platform? Or is it a proactive move to protect your users? What's the outlook that your organization takes on that? I guess both sides, maybe more actually, maybe three, uh, three reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, to protect the user, of course, so we don't really, uh, we only let a user be authorized in one device, so uh, they can really log in from an iPad at the same time. If they do, we force uh, log out on the other device. Um, uh, to protect our own systems as well, because then you have more uh, uh, ports open if you let multiple connections from the same user. But also, where is my domain of expertise? From, from a marketing and cost point of view, uh, there's lots of fraud going on in the mobile industry. So uh, th that's, uh, we spend quite a lot of time actually analyzing traffic and fraud coming to our platform. Great. May I add? Uh, what sorts of data uh, do, you know, do your organization collect and, and how do you put that into use? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, rather than what we collect, I'm going to talk about the usage of it. Sure. So uh, we have, uh, so uh, from a high level, we, we, ha we have data to make decisions, customer behaviors, or even uh, interviewing customers, I said, to capture those kind of data as well, as well as uh, providing um, personalization uh, by automatically uh, sort of translating the data into nudges and sort of uh, in, in their processes. But uh, we also use data as sort of a non-customer. So for example, every developer, uh, we track their code hmm. and security checks fully automated. Interesting. So uh, we know exactly that level. So we look at the level of security from, because you know, a lot of internal fraud happen, or mistakes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we set a rule for even at that level, because we don't want any harm to come up to our customers. The other interesting part is taking data and actually feeding it back to the customer. For example, we, we are completely transparent about what type of data we collect and also uh, how the data is getting used. So we have a dashboard in the mobile app where uh, customers can log in and see who is using the, their data from other banks maybe using the, their API of the bank. So we clearly state and they can stop it or review those kind of data. That, you know, and that's a, that's a, a great segue to talk about uh, open banking. Um, you know, given the fact that now with the, the regulations as they sit, uh, the, the cross usage of, of APIs is, is not only mandated, it's in, encouraged. Um, you know, and, and that sounds like a great idea to uh, have visibility uh, into that API. Um, Giannis, uh, has uh, the PSD2 regulation changed, uh, you know, as a, as a younger uh, entity in, uh, you know, in bringing a product to market? Uh, you know, obviously you had the opportunity to build things in. How has the PSD2 regulations changed the data that you, you know, sort of incorporate into your matrix and how you use it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think other than um, uh, the structure of the data, which is actually the prim uh, primary way of uh, uh, using PSD to, uh, to standardize it across organizations, uh, made us uh, think of uh, how do we make uh, better usage from a customer experience point of view to uh, things like customer loyalty. How can we uh, really enforce loyalty when uh, uh, we haven't integrated yet, when we will integrate fully? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would say uh, it affects uh, the whole business strategy, uh, not only uh, the security element or the, or the app architecture, but uh, it has a wider, bigger impact uh, in our thinking. Mm. Ramzan, as, as a little bit further along the journey, uh, is, has that held true for you, uh, or is that you know, sort of in progress as well? No, it has definitely held true. Um, when, when, when PSD2 come, came into effect, we, um, we, we, we had a, a head start because uh, we are part of an alliance called Sparebank One, which is 14 banks, uh, which is individual ent entities, and we compete uh, in, the, in the Norwegian market. But we actually had the possibility to integrate each other's accounts before the PS2, PSD2 came into effect because we, we, we have the same infrastructure provider. 
Um, so to us, it was it, it was kind of well known how how that part worked, but obviously we opened up to to some of our competitors as well, and and it really did um, uh, challenge not only the data part of it, but also the whole infrastructure. How do you redefine security? How do you actually monetize also that type of uh, that type of uh, uh, business model because uh, it, it, it opens up for some opportunities that you didn't have before and that infrastructure we did not have uh, in, in place. How do you actually make sure as Mehdad also mentions that we want to give some control back to the user as well be, be, for them being able to see how their accounts and how their data is actually being shared across uh, financial institutions but also third parties um, and that is something we also built into the app and we had very good feedback from our customers like, wow, now we can actually see how our data is being uh, distributed. And that, uh, again, playing on the, on, the, on, the, on the trust currency as well, that, I think that is uh, something that builds, builds loyalty all the time. Hmm. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, I, I, you've already talked a little bit about, you know, one usage of uh, that sort of, you know, open data so that users have uh, visibility as they're using cross services. Uh, has that affected uh, the way that you, you know, measure fraud in any way, given the fact that, you know, users definitely have patterns in the way that they access services. How would you say that, you know, the sort of that watching that transition of a user throughout their normal ecosystem has changed the way that you deal with fraud internally? I think uh, not just from Rabobank points of view, but uh, I think the ultimate user experience would be that if we had enough detection and knowing who the user is, then you wouldn't even require login. So I think that's something that... Uh, Do you, you really know, think that's reasonable I, or, I, or realistic? Uh, I think if you could have uh, invisible, the good enough invisible sort of uh, fraud detection, mm. that could be possible. But uh, I think, uh, well, currently it's not, but then you can have like a layered security on uh, depending on what action the user is taking and then step up or detect on, uh, I think we earlier, uh, there was talks about uh, device detection, what if it's fraudulent device or geolocation, all those sort of different aspects of it. But I think the, the piece I'm more concerned about is the open banking and the lack of understanding from a customer's point of view, because I was, and the way the banks and uh, sort of the aggregators are dealing with it is all different. So when we say uh, the customer says that they want to stop, they don't want to sort of use this service anymore, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize that the actual uh, the data provider can still keep their old historical data. Mm -hmm. So from a customer's point, I don't think anybody I've spoken to knows that's the fact. So I think we have these issues of one, the regulators want to push like open banking, but at the same time you have GDPR advertising, even in Netherlands, going to completely against it, mm -hmm. saying don't sign up to any, so anybody that wants to take your data and then say, on the other hand, go to open banking. And then you see that uh, depending on different banks, they're dealing with it differently. Some are keeping the historical data and making it quite difficult for the customer to get rid of. So that's the my main concern mm. from, mm. Uh, from the open banking point. How, how, you know, given the fact that, you know, again, for, from my perspective of working with a lot of different, uh, you know, banks and financial institutions to help uh, secure their, their mobile and their web app experiences, um, correlation uh, becomes one of the biggest problems uh, and challenges uh, with data uh, because, you know, as we're talking about things like device reputation uh, correlated with network uh, devices and uh, network detection mechanisms going back to API usage and then, you know, what ultimately results in a transaction. Uh, we have so many different data sources that have to work together. And what that practically means in organizations is that you have a lot of different groups working together. Um, how do you, in your organizations, deal with 
passing information or passing intelligence from security to user experience or user journey, and then also you know, from a brand and marketing and a product perspective uh, to be able to work together. Uh, have you found a, a, a formula that, that works for you know, communicating these things internally? Uh, Giannis, you want to start with you? Yeah. Uh, for us, we kept it simple, actually, and I think it works really well. Uh, not only the way we, how we structure uh, teams, so uh, we run multiple small product teams focusing on uh, parts of uh, uh, the services we operate. Uh, these product teams, they don't only embed engineers, but they embed uh, somebody from compliance, uh, maybe not full time, but uh, one person covers two, three teams, uh, somebody from uh, data security, and somebody from uh, marketing. So we have product marketing people as well. So by uh, bringing them uh, along the journey of creating a product, they, they have the opportunity to, to give feedback quite early and uh, raise any red flags. And uh, he's, been working, uh, he's been working really well for us. Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah, so, so, so we have several levels uh, of, of, of governance, so to speak, in order to make sure that, that, that the integrity and the, and the validity of the data is actually kept intact. So the Sparebank One Alliance, which actually has all our data on the transactions and the usage uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the mobile platform and the uh, e-banking solutions, um, all these data are propagated back to each of the 14 banks, respectively. So, so I'm not able to see uh, our sister bank's data. It is totally siloed. Uh, and when we get the data from, from, uh, from Sparebank One, we are able to make sure that it is valid. Uh, we do uh, quality control of it, and then we distribute it to the, to the entire organization. Mm -hmm. So we try to have um, a good data governance around it. We try to produce transparency so you can see where the, each, uh, each of the, uh, the, the variables actually come from, what is the source, how did it get there, what type of... Uh, transformation has it been through and what type of um, business logic has been applied because we do some type of transformation for the business user to actually get some value out of the data. Uh, and I fact actually feel that it works quite well when you have this type of discussion and you have the tools in order to actually be able to do that because uh, when you have this type of transparency, it also makes people more independent. They're not depending on one central a business intelligence or data warehouse uh, entity to produce all the reports and all the knowledge, but you actually put it in the hands and the, uh, of, of the business users who actually has the the knowledge of how you want to use the, this data, and that is basically where where the magic is going to happen. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm not involved in the sort of the fraud detection <laughs> rules. Uh, but I think in general, uh, we have quite a strict policy on uh, who sees the data and who can handle the data, uh, and both analytics and also customer-based uh, data. Uh, and from, uh, is, as I said, we, are, we try to uh, incorporate it, both for, for customers and for us, that if you have authorization, you can use. Uh, different levels internally and also externally depending on your authorization. So it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's almost like the part of their day-to-day -day process. It's, it's funny because uh, I, one of the things that I love to point out is uh, when we've, as a, an industry or as a, you know, a security organization, uh, solved a problem long ago uh, because all of these things that we're describing is good, strong role-based ac access control, uh, you know, from a security perspective, which was Bell LaPodula back in the 1960s. And so it's funny to remember that we're kind of going back to the basics in some ways. Um, so, so, so my next question is sort of either what opportunity do you think is the biggest emerging opportunity to use data uh, you know, maybe in a non-traditional way. So yes, it's great to use it for security. Yes, it's great to use it for, uh, you know, for, for making sure that uh, our customers are effectively using. What, what do you think the ne next frontier is? So, you know, uh, Ramton, you, you, you have, a, you have yeah, a look in your eye I, that you want to I, I have a funny, funny use case we actually, we actually did because we invited, we invited some of our customers. It was a handful of customers. And we asked them a question. Um, 
how much of a discount on your mortgage would, would require you to give away all your data to us and the consent that follows for us to use it as we see fit, hmm. including selling to third party, doing whatever we want with it. Uh, obviously, it was, a, it was a thought exercise, but we wanted to just to test out and see what, 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 what would happen. And uh, I think we landed on, on, on an average of, I think it was 13% discount on the mortgage was like, all right, yeah, I, I would consider actually trying to sell my data to my bank for them to do whatever uh, they wanted to do with it. And it, it was kind of a, you call it frontier. I don't think it was a frontier per se, but it was more of a eye opener saying, all right, so, so, so there's actually some monetization going on here. You, you could actually try to break possibly a frontier saying that, all right, we give you, we give you a, a discounted mortgage if you can actually uh, uh, sell us your data. And that actually complies very well with how the younger generations think, right? If you look at how they, uh, how they um, behave on TikTok and Snapchat and all these social media, they're giving the data away any day, all the time, in real time. And they're doing this for free. So why not get something out of it by getting a, a cheaper mortgage or, or being able to buy the dream house or dream car that you want? So there's a, there's, I know there's a lot of ethics behind that as well, <laughs> uh, but that was not the question. <laughs> Would they give it away for free coffee? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so you're saying a t-shirt doesn't work anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in, anybody else want to jump in on that one? Uh, I just wanted to agree, actually. Um, we, we, we are exploring different ways of uh, using customers' data to monetize our product and actually uh, reduce the fees that the customer is paying to us uh, for using our services. Mm. We don't have a solution yet, but uh, it's definitely in our minds and we, we discuss a lot about it. Because I think, especially in retail banking, uh, UK is a, is a bright example. The retail banking is usually free. Mm. So we're trying to find ways to push it to free and monetize differently. Interesting. That'll never happen in Netherlands. <laughs> so it, it, they, will, they will totally kill the bank if they try to sell their data in any shape or form. Mm. Just completely against sharing data. Even uh, I worked on uh, Google Assistant and banking and uh, customers, even though we, we assured them that Google are not going to use their data, they wouldn't believe us. So is the paranoia and they're really strict on. And I think it's right mm. that they should be, that they shouldn't sell it for 13% so, discount. Or so, so you're saying that the, uh, the, the Dutch people are more conservative than the Norwegians? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> From a data point, yes. I mean, uh, even though the Dutch don't like to pay for anything, they still pay for their banking mm. because of, I think one of the reasons is because of this, that they'd rather pay that few euros and rather than you use their data in order to provide free banking. Wow. That's, a, that's actually really interesting. I mean, I, I know that, every, uh, like, be, you know, being from America, obviously I'm biased, but I, you know, I, it's, I'm surprised because I think everybody over, here, over in my neck of the woods has, has a price. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question? Please. So, 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 how, so what about the younger generations in, in, in the Netherlands? Do, don't they use TikTok and Snapchat and all those? They do. Uh, so I was uh, telling people earlier, I went to University of Delft to do uh, innovation talks. And uh, they were outraged <laughs> that Rabobank was looking at new innovation. And they said, please be careful, because we trust you. So the line is quite small. So they, even the younger generation didn't like us crossing the line. So uh, they, they, they think of, especially Rabobank and the big banks in Netherlands especially, that we trust you. Why would you do something stupid as go to, like the fintechs? Uh, so they said, we want to, when we grow up, I want to get a mortgage with you. I don't want you to be sort of uh, taking risk from that level. Hmm. So it's a bit of a difference. Interesting. Hmm. Maybe it's a geographical. <laughs> <laughs> have, um, have any of the data breaches, uh, either in the industry or outside of the industry, materially affected your business? Uh, I would say not really, but uh, we're quite new and there was no big breach so far when it comes to, to our closest competitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess when that happens, it's going to hurt everybody. Mm. Yeah. 
I don't believe so. Um, obviously, it, it gives some thought uh, when you hear uh, stuff from Cambridge Analytica and a lot of those uh, Facebook and so on. It, 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 it strengthens the point that you're, you're making in terms of would I let people use my data? But, but, but I think the most uh, issues that we have had were actually government uh, mm. institutions who had leaked uh, some data somehow, uh, uh, not less from the, less from the uh, private sector, uh, not to mention the, I haven't heard anything about the banking, but, but obviously it, it, it's a pressing issue that will, will rise and it will keep coming again and again uh, when, you, uh, when you see that people are distributing the data more and more, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would say it's, it's, I think people are, uh, they trust the banks, but they don't trust the big tech mm -hmm. as such mm -hmm. with their data. So that's the, I think that's the setup in Netherlands uh, mm. speci specifically. Mm. But I think, uh, I, I hope, I get a feeling that actually banks are gaining trust now versus the big techs because of this. So the, uh, I, I, I actually think uh, people, probably trust banks more to handle their data mm. than, than Facebook. So we, we did some uh, research with the younger generation as well. They, they, they're actually, uh, I think you need to look at that generation and don't put them in a the box. Mm. They're, they're actually quite varied in how they think. Mm. So I think it's a mistake to say, oh, everybody's using TikTok, TikTok is also you know, uh, doesn't want a safe mm. banking, you know, or they, they, they'd rather, you know, you, uh, you use their data. I'm not sure if that's the case. Mm. But, 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 are, but isn't the, the banks using the big techs? Aren't you using Amazon and Microsoft and Google to serve some of your uh, pl pl platform? We are, but we have very strict conditions. I, I think I, I was involved in the Google uh, partnership and uh, yeah, we, 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 they basically was a standoff that uh, we wouldn't let them use their data. It was mm. a very strict conditions that Google are not allowed to use any mm. or just even see or do anything with their data in any shape or form. Mm. They just serve as a, you know, they provide the functionality, but they're not allowed to legally touch the data. Interesting. So, I, I guess uh, I, I'll, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll throw it to the audience for any more questions. But as a follow-up to the, the previous question uh, about you know breaches in the industry or breaches in technology, um, as a rough estimate, and, and you know ha it never hasten the day, uh, if, if there was a data breach. Um, say of your mobile or your API or something like that where unauthorized access happens, what percentage of the business or what aspect of the business is, is just gone immediately? Um, you know, and, and, and what, how, how, how devastating would that be in reality, do you think? Uh, and, and if you, you want to take a pass on this, that's totally fine. Um, I just, I, I'm trying to get a sense of you know, with the advent of cyber insurance and all of the other risk averse, uh, you know, policies that you can put into place, you know, what is the relative level of how worried are you or you, how worried is your organization uh, that your data might be misused? Very hard to quantify. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the data, but it's different when, uh, let's say, um, uh, you, you link the types of products that customers have, Versus a full statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, very, very, very hard to quantify from mm. the end. Okay. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's difficult to, basically, you're, 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 uh, uh, you're wanting a risk assessment of what would, uh, what would happen. Um, I, think, I think it will be quite uh, devastating at first, but touching back on, on, on trust being the most important currency for, for banks, uh, I think it would blow over relatively quick uh, because uh, um, I think at least in the in the Scandinavian countries uh, the, the trust between uh, between customers and banks is something like sixty percent or something like it's, yeah. it's quite high um, and and people don't change banks really often uh, once you're born into a bank you have it until you get your first mortgage and and, and so on although it is actually quite easy to change your bank. 
Um, so I think some of the basic mechanism of, of, of trust actually helps us there mm. in terms of diminishing the, 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 the catastrophic results of, 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 of a data leak. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think we'll ever put ourselves in that situation <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I think uh, taking risks is fine, but never take a risk to bring down that reputation. I think you talked about trust being the currency. I think that's the biggest currency for the bank especially, mm. because anybody could set up a company and do the banking, mm. which we've seen a lot of people do. <laughs> but uh, I think that's the, the thing that is, I'll just keep reiterating this, especially for the bigger banks, uh, are that actually that is your ma main currency. Mm. Uh, and you can't put it in, jeopardize that. Mm. So we would, we would put all efforts to that never could happen. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, okay, audience. I'm sure you've been cooking up a good question. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Uh, just building on that, I, I agree. You know, trust is absolutely kind of vital there, and I think uh, actually, you know, as we've seen already with the sort of switching, actually, people shifting their whole account to another one, it, it isn't happening in there. There's that aspect of trust. But what we have seen more of are lots of kind of sub accounts being created and my you're probably one of the worst for that yeah. in terms of multiple so <laughs> is that almost kind of death by a thousand cuts in there so yes you need to establish trust as your kind of core bank but actually does that then just become a a mechanism that you route money through and then it goes out to various kind of you know smaller entities that you use for i don't know budgeting coffee lunch whatever else it may be yeah. And actually, you don't trust them with actually that's where all your direct debits, that's where your salary goes, that's where your big financial decisions. But, you know, are you really winning in that respect? Or have you actually just lost the customer relationship? I can answer that. I'm going to use, uh, Joost has got good examples, by the way, if you want to talk to them after. But his um, example is Bank was uh, basically one of the great fintechs. I I'm, I'm keep going on about how great the functionality is. And we were concerned that there may be taking the new generation are going to bank, but uh, they charge, they have to charge more money than us, but they provide a lot of good functionality, and they had Apple Pay. But as soon as we brought Apple Pay, then customers are almost shifting back to us, because how long, you know, they bring good uh, features, great, we just take it and put it in our app. You know, uh, so it's like, we've got the trust, and we can get our customers back as well. So that even the new generation is now saying, actually, it's much more stable to use Rabobank. Uh, OK, I've still got bank, but the more we are taking and bringing you know, much cheaper proposition and much safer proposition, and with all the functionality, then which one would you rather mm -hmm. take? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, any, any other questions? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's lethal. <laughs> I have a question for Yannis. Yep. Um, I can imagine as a challenger bank, your speed is very high and uh, your time to market is very low of new features. How do you ensure that your decision-making process is always fact-based so that you're actually using the data to base your decisions on? Uh, great question. Uh, I think it's a cultural uh, approach. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we recently measured it. Uh, we got a new HR software, and uh, we wanted to see how many people uh, uh, query directly the database because our database is view-only access is open to to everybody. We had over 60% of the company uh, using SQL and uh, running their own queries. Uh, that runs into big uh, problems as well when you try to build something. For example, don't make the mistake and say that the percentage of uh, people who do in the national money transfers was 62%, but the reality was 60. Somebody's going to kill you in the room. Uh, so yeah, uh, we developed a, a culture that uh, people actually feel comfortable with data, but uh, it has a side effect, which is uh, uh, we always forget the qualitative part of it. Hmm. So we're uh, too focused on numbers and not the overall experience. Well, uh, th thank you all for your attention. Uh, that is our time. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day.